Welcome into the Tuesday, February 7th edition of the Lockdown Leafs podcast. I'm Mike DiStefano with Dave Morissuti. Uh, NHL All-Star Weekend in the rearview mirror, but the Maple Leafs on their bye week, so they don't play until Friday, Dave. But you and I still got a lot to talk about, Dan. We're going to play some co-side, no-side today, some Leaf topics, some overarching NHL topics will come up. And uh, I also have my power ranking that I'm going to release today. Five most attractive trade assets for the Toronto Maple Leafs. There's a couple on there that you might not have expected. So stay tuned. All that coming up on today's edition of Locked on Leafs. Your Locked on Maple Leafs, your daily podcast on the Toronto Maple Leafs. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome into the Locked On Leafs podcast, your one-stop shop for all things Leafs. I'm your host, Mike DiStefano from TSN 1050 Toronto Radio, also known as Al's brother on TSN's Overdrive and TSN 1050's Leafs Lunch. Joining me, it's my co-host Dave Morissuti from Sportsnet, also a writer for the NHLPA, Locked On Leafs, a daily Maple Leafs-centric podcast. So be sure to subscribe for free. Wherever you get your podcast from, you can also now view us on YouTube. Subscribe to us. It's Locked On Leafs. Uh, we really, really appreciate it. We got new videos and podcasts coming out each and every weekday, Monday through Friday. It's all Leafs all the time here on the Locked On Leafs pod. And this episode is brought to you by the FanDuel Sportsbook, official sportsbook of the Locked On Network. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. Well, hockey's back, Dave. Still, a couple of days till the Maple Leafs get back on the ice. I don't think they can return to practice until Thursday. And then they got the back-to-back against Columbus uh, in Columbus on Friday and then back home in Toronto on on uh, Saturday. And then another, like, layoff. Then they don't play again until Wednesday and they have Chicago. So uh, a bit of a, a, a soft schedule right now for the Toronto Maple Leafs, both in terms of opponents with their first five opponents being – Columbus twice, Chicago twice, and Montreal. And then it's also just spaced out nicely. So good time for guys to heal up and a uh, good time for Toronto to, uh, you know, make up some ground or more so. I guess they're not really going to make up ground on Boston, but maybe separate themselves from Tampa, who took an L last night. Mm-hmm. Dave. Oh, mm-hmm. they got dummy by the Florida Panthers. I did not see that coming. Nope. Not a 7-1. At first, I saw it was 4-1 going into the third period. I'm like, yeah, this makes me feel pretty good. 4-1 lead. What could go wrong? Panthers are just like, no, no, no. We know how to hold a 4-1 lead, apparently. So, good on them. Wow. It's a big, big W. Wow. You just had to go there. Just subtly go there. You just had to go there. Um, yeah. So, I guess that's, that's good for Toronto. I think with that loss, Toronto technically leapfrogs them in terms of points percentage or... Tampa falls down just a, a tad in terms of points percentage, I believe, would be the case. Um, I think this how many games in hand Tampa had. Like when they went into this break, Tampa had four games in hand. Now just three. Now just three. Did the Tampa Bay Lightning just like not play games this whole time? Like, uh, well, I mean, there was an all star break. So, <laughs> yeah. But like, I think them and the Red Wings were like the only two teams that had. 48 games played. Mm. Going into, I think only three teams had under 50 games played going into the All-Star break. It was the Lightning, the Red Wings, and the Penguins on the, in the East. I don't know about the West, though. Yeah, well, I mean, eventually everyone's going to play 82, so they'll catch up. They'll definitely catch up. Just means that they're going to have a little bit uh, uh, harder of a schedule, I suppose. they got to fit four more games in where the Leafs don't have to, right? So we already talked about the next two weeks being super cushy. Um, Just not a whole lot of games. There's a lot of space in between, and they're playing a lot of bad teams. Um, Which Tampa's not. (laughs) No, They got Colorado twice coming up. Yes, Tampa. It's going to be tough for for Tampa, that's for sure. Um, Colorado's starting to play, man. Like That team is starting to play. Like We start to look around the league, and and the teams that we – you know, expected to be good this year, but maybe get off to a slow start. They're starting to ramp up. Like, I mean, the Florida Panthers, that they're not out of it, Dave. Like, they're not out of it. I don't know if they can, 
you know, make a, a, a charge for one of the divisional spots, but they're only a couple points out of a wild card spot. So they certainly can easily get themselves back into it. And then there'll be a handful once they do get into the wild card. You know, I think uh, Colorado, they're getting right back into the mix there. Um, you know, Edmonton for a while was teetering. And, and now I think they're a team that certainly, I mean, I think they could potentially win the division here. So mm-hmm. there's a lot of good teams out there that, that have gone deep in the past uh, little bit that got off to some slower starts or hit a little bit of a, uh, you know, a speed bump. But as you get to the midway through the final stretch of the season, you know, the real teams start to show up, right? The cream rises to the top. And I think when all said and done that the teams we expect to be in the playoffs will be, and probably will be performing at a pretty high quality. Um, so Dave, what we're going to be doing today is we're going to play some cosign, no sign, which is a, a segment that we love to do here on the show. And, and with there being no games, it's actually a good chance just to do like, you know, a good hardy cosign, no sign segment where we could do three a piece and really get into the nitty gritty of what's going on, not only in Leafs nation, but also around the league. And then I also have a power ranking that I'm going to unveil my five most attractive trade assets for the Toronto Maple Leafs. So I've got five pieces that I think would be most attractive by the rest of the league. If Toronto's looking to make a splash and go and acquire some pieces at the deadline, these are the five most valuable pieces that I believe they have. Um, so we'll do that in just a little bit as well. But let's play some cosine, no sign first. Um, so the way this works, if, if you're new to the podcast, and if you are, shout out. Thank you so much for giving us a, a, a shot here. If you enjoy the content, please do subscribe. We'd really appreciate that. Uh, but the way that this game works is Dave and I are going to make statements to each other. If we agree with it, we're going to co-sign it. If we disagree with it, then we're going to no-sign the statement. Uh, Dave, why don't you uh, why don't you go first and give me your first statement here? Uh, this one's a little out of the box. We haven't really brought in other sports really to our co-sign, no-signs. Cool. But the NBA trade deadline is this week. Mm. And I'm going to make a bit of a connection here because there's the Raptors could be potentially – a big, uh, big uh, mo- suit at all. A big team in terms of deals. Yeah. So I'm gonna say the Raptors make more trades than the Leafs at their respective trade deadlines. A little cross sport action in the city. I love it. Sean oh, from Locked On Raptors, if you're if you are listening, I better get major props for this. We'll we'll tell him. He'll probably play. He he would play the segment on on Locked On Raptors. I bet. Um, okay, so before I give you the answer, I'm going to go through my rationale because mm-hmm. I actually don't know the answer yet. So I'm going to talk myself through it. Okay, so the Raptors are an interesting team just because we don't really know where they're going to go. I think we've assumed at this point that this is a, a squad that probably are looking at moving some of their bigger pieces. Um, but who who are those guys, and how many of them are they going to move? Right. I think you can expect a guy like Thaddeus Young to to get dealt. You know, some of those fringer pieces, Gary Trent Jr. I expect to go. But do they do they dig a little deeper? Does it does Fred Van Bleek get traded if he's not willing to come back next year? You know, do they go uh OG Ananobi? Do they move on from him? So I'm thinking at least there'll be at least two trades for the Raptors. Do I think there'll be two plus trades for the Maple Leafs? Well, when we think about what the Leafs need, I think they need to get themselves a, a top six winger and a physical defenseman. It doesn't necessarily have to be a top four guy. That would be preferable, I would say, but doesn't necessarily have to be. So can you do that in 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 one transaction? And then is there anything else that the team needs? I, I think you could also kind of get some more depth adds. You can never, ever hurt your team by adding depth to in rounding out depth in your roster. So maybe a third line center, a a fourth line winger, potentially. I doubt you're going to be able to make all of these deals with one team. You're probably going to have to make a couple of trades to, to shore it up, whether you're giving up fourth, fifth round picks, B level prospects, you know, first round pick. If you're looking to land a big piece, I think the Maple Leafs are going to be more busy. uh, I think is, is, is where I'm going to lean here. Cause I think, you know, I, I don't think as many pieces are going to be moved for the Toronto Raptors. I think the Maple Leafs, though, are going to be hungry and looking to acquire and and, and buy a bunch of pieces and go out there, and there'll be massive buyers at the deadline this week this year. I think there's 
you know, a couple of spots that they could use upgrades in. So I could see them being very busy. So I'm going to, uh, what was the question? The lease. So you're will... going to no sign it because you're saying that the lease will make more deals on the Raptors. Yes. I will no sign the Raptors making more deals. I think the lease will be the busier team at the deadline. I think the Raptors will be taking a lot of calls. I think that they'll be like literally busy just because they're going to be on the phone for the next 48 hours. But I'm not sure that they actually pull the trigger on, on as many deals as, Toronto can right like Toronto they they've got more draft picks they've got you know some prospects that they can move out and they just there's more pieces to an NHL roster to fill than there is in the NBA so based on that logic I'll, I'll also no sign it and say I think the Maple Leafs will be a, a bit more busy and they'll make more trades than the Toronto Raptors I like it though it's a good one thank you so what's yours okay Actually, let's take one quick break, and then we'll come back, and we'll do a couple more, and then uh, and then we'll get to the, the trade assets piece. Um, before we go, though, let me tell you guys about one of today's show sponsors. It's FanDuel, one of our favorite sponsors here at the Lockdown Network this year. The only app that you're going to need for your Super Bowl party is the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's the number one sportsbook app in North America. Really excited about our new sports betting partner for Lockdown because of the number one sportsbook in North America. It's FanDuel, and if you're new to FanDuel, it's even better. They have so many great features that can make betting on sports fun and easy. You can download FanDuel now so that you can bet on Super Bowl 57 with a no-sweat first bet. You'll get up to $3,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. FanDuel lets you bet on everything from the money line to point spreads to who's going to score a touchdown. Heck, I took uh, last night the over in the Canucks and the Jersey game. That definitely cashed as <laughs> that one went into overtime. It was 5-4. Uh, the FanDuel Sportsbook app is safe, secure, super easy to use. Best of all, you can get your winnings instantly. So join FanDuel today at FanDuel.com slash locked on to claim your no sweat first bet on Super Bowl 57. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more with FanDuel, the official sportsbook partner of the NFL and the Locked On Network. Welcome back into the Locked On Lease podcast. I'm Mike DeStefano with Dave Morissuti. We're your hosts here at the Locked On Lease podcast, playing a little bit of cosign, no sign, as the Maple Leafs are on their bye week. Um, and since they're on their bye week, I thought, let me get a, a, a league-wide question in uh, before we you know, continue on talking with uh, some more Leafs chatter. Um, so my statement here is the Buffalo Sabres will make – the Stanley Cup playoffs. Ooh, that's a good one. Uh, let me see where they are right now, just so I can get a gauge of how they're doing in the standings here. Uh, this yeah, is so currently the Buffalo Sabres are on the outside looking in. They got 56 points and sit one point shy of the Pittsburgh Penguins, but have one extra game played. But they have games in hand on Washington. They do. Hmm. Oh, and you know what? I think they're they're a team that could swing big at the trade deadline. They got a lot of assets and some decent cap space. Hmm. But then again, they also got teams like New York and the uh, the Islanders, the Panthers. They're chasing as well. And the Penguins are going to probably make a deal too. I'm gonna no sign it just because. I'm not I'm not able to commit to that goaltending as being good enough to get them to the playoffs. You don't think they make a move to improve and upgrade the goaltending? I just don't know what they would trade for. Like who's the like you know now the Islanders are not trading anyone off of significance off the roster, so Varlamov no. is not happening. I don't see the Panthers I don't see the Panthers moving in their goalies. I don't know what team is going to give up a goaltender at this stage in the game that's going to really move the needle for Buffalo. Could potentially get yourself a Karel Vimelka out of uh, out of Arizona if if they really are like blowing it up and like take take whatever you want. You know that could be an option potentially. I don't know if you want to go the Jonas Corposalo route, but he would be someone who I imagine would be available if you wanted to get him. A, a Capo Cac and then a James Reimer out of San Jose potentially could be available. I mean, there's no 
surefire guys, I suppose, to to your point. You could roll the dice on like a Jonathan Quick potentially. If LA wants to get out of that deal, maybe, you know, I I, I don't know, but that's a, another possibility. Um there's options. Options. They could they could get a goalie, but still it's uh, one of those one one of you would have to be banking on one of Sid or Ovi to fall out of the playoff picture for that to happen, right? Yeah, exactly. And that's that's the other thing too is I, I just see the Penguins as long as Crosby and Malkin are there, they're gonna always be buyers at the deadline. Uh, the Capitals have been you no, know, they've had they played some good stretches here, so I don't know how they like yeah, I just find it it's just a very tough road for the Sabres right now. They could do it, but I mean, we also don't know how long Tage Thompson is going to be out for. That's a significant blow for That's them good. as well. That's a good point. Let me really quickly actually check and see if there's an update there because I actually completely forgot that he had gotten injured the day before the season ended. Um, Tage Thompson. Yeah, because then he didn't end up going to the All Star game. Rasmus Dahlin ended up filling in for him because of the injury there. Hopefully, it's not a long term injury. Um, yeah, like they said, it was an upper body injury. Yeah, they're still considering it uh, an upper body injury. I don't know. I don't see an update. Maybe because I mean they're they're on a buy so. You know, I, don't, I guess we're not going to probably not going to get one until they return from their buy. So don't believe. Well, when you're injured, maybe you are allowed to go to team facilities. I don't know. That one's. Uh, yeah, you're right. Tage I think, yeah, I think that's the right. only. I think that's the rule. Like, if you're dealing with an injury, the like free like the rosters like the not being able to go to the facility is is different. Yeah, like I'd imagine Matthews was able to go to the facility if he wanted to. Um. You know, I'm sure anybody really. Matt, Matt Murray was dealing with an ankle issue. Uh, so you're a you're a, a bad call. You, you're yeah. you're a, a, a no sign. All right. I think they're gonna make it. I'm gonna go opposite just just to uh, to be opposite of you. I think they'll make it. I do. Wanna wanna sit Rovi not making the playoffs? It'll be Tage Thompson, and it'll be the Buffalo Sabers. All right. Next one. Next one for me. Is I mean, this one might might it's a little bit of a cheap one, but I say the Leafs find a way to beef up their top six at the deadline. Top six four group. Yeah, top uh, six four. Cosign. Absolutely cosign. I, whether or not whether or not that's Timo Meyer or somebody else who I may have as one of my. Cosign no signs that I don't want to spoil quite yet. Uh, you know what I will. I'll just like what if it's like an like an Ivan Barbashev to me would be an upgrade on Cal Yarncroc, right? Like he's not Timo Meyer, obviously. He's not Patrick Kane, but he still is an upgrade that could play in your top six. Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna co-sign it. I, I think that that's at, at this point, it seems like that is a priority for the Maple Leafs to add that extra element of scoring and I know uh, you pay four guys so much money to score up front. How do you possibly need more scoring? You just do. And, and this team does like it is what it is. And you can complain about it all you want, but at the end of the day, they would be very much beneficial. If they got one more guy who could maybe score a goal or two in a series. Cause that's really been the difference over the last few seasons, right? It's, it really comes down to a goal or two, Either whether it's on the power play at five on five in late game situations, that's really what it comes down to. So you get one more guy should be able to help. So I, I co-sign. I believe that they'll they want to do it, and I believe they'll get it done as well. Okay. Um. Okay. I'll s- switch gears here. I was going to ask you about Ivan Barbashev. Do you like that name, by the way? Uh, I don't. I don't hate it. You know, it, it's for some people it probably doesn't scream, you know, that Timo because we've heard a lot about Timo Meyer lately. Even like a Travis Konechny, some people would like a Travis Konechny, but I think Barbashev is he brings a different element that I think this team does need in that top six. Yeah, they speed, need 
a little bit of ruggedness, a little yeah. bit. Yeah, I agree. Can score again 26, 28 goals last year, 60 points a season. Yeah, so I, th- I think Ivan Barbashev could, uh, could could be a decent little option when when he's playing with good players. Typically, he produces, and and that'll be the case if he's in the Toronto's top six. Uh, all right, I'll I'll pivot and switch gears to this one here. So. The Maple Leafs have a lot of free agents this upcoming offseason. David Camp should be the most prioritized free agent for the Maple Leafs this offseason. So what you're saying is that the Leafs should maybe prioritize David Camp over your boy, Michael Bunting. I'm not saying that. The statement is saying that, my friend. (laughs) The statement is saying that. If you want to no sign it, you're more than welcome to. Hmm. I'm going to no sign it because I do think Michael Bunting will be the top priority in terms of... Now, we're talking about unrestricted free agents, right? Because technically, yeah. Ilya Samsonov is a free agent, but a restricted free agent. You know what? I'm going to open it up. Any free agent of any kind for Toronto. I, I would say Samsonov might be the top priority just because you know, they, they took a chance on him. He's doing well. And whoo. Yes, I, I would agree with that one. My, my only concern, it's not even a concern, but like you sign him, which they probably should. Let's, let's say that. Mm-hmm. I don't think you're going to have, if you're going to bring him back in long-term, you're going to sign to a deal with term and money, obviously. That means that you're gonna have to find a taker for Matt Murray's contract, right? Yeah. Like and there's I, no way you can come with both of those guys next year on big ticket deals. Now, the good thing about Matt Murray now is he's got one year left on his deal. And Ottawa's already taken some of that cap hit. What's the cash? What's the cash there, Dave? Cash. How much of it is signing bonus? Yeah, no, well, it's Ottawa. There was no signing bonus. Ah, which makes it more difficult to trade him. It is a high salary. It's eight million bucks. So you gotta find someone who's willing to take on well, I guess 75% of eight million, because I think Ottawa retained 25%. Uh, so I guess six million dollars. I believe so, yeah. Yeah, so you gotta find someone who's willing to pay him. Six million dollars, like that's where it becomes difficult to move. Mm-hmm. Matt Murray, very difficult to move. It's gonna, it's gonna cost you. Like you gotta pay somebody in assets to to take that on. If if he doesn't turn it around, if he comes back and is healthy and and plays well, best case scenario for Toronto. But if this injury becomes a situation, um, and then you lose your you know, trust in this guy, unless he ends up on Robita Island, which not out of the question, I guess. Uh, this could be tricky this summer getting out of that deal, like Patrick Marlowe level tricky. I think it's, it's not wrong to say that because that is still a significant deal. But there are going to be teams I think they'll take it. I mean, the other thing too is he has a modified no trade clause, so there's that off that that thing also impacts it as well. But I just think Joseph Wall believes he's the, he casts a stick in the NHL next year. So you're not going to carry three goaltenders next year. This is true. This is true. So you're going to have to make your decision. Although I've been pumping the brakes on the Joseph. Do you have a question about Joseph Wall by chance? I do not. Okay. So I've been pumping the brakes there a little bit just because I do remember like Garrett Sparks at the same age, had the same amount of hype, was AHL goalie of the year. He was the best goalie in the minors. This guy's going to be the dude. And then they kept him over Curtis McElhaney, and we're still talking about how bad of a decision that was. So just because he's lighting it up in the American League doesn't necessarily mean that he's the goalie of the future for the Toronto Maple Leafs. He could be, don't get me wrong. You know, they picked him, you know, third round pick, went to Boston College. You know, he's a, a player, maybe went to Boston University. Either way, one of those Boston schools, a good hockey school. Um, I, you know, he could very well become a very good goaltender. But I've just 
pumping the brakes a little bit on that one because I've seen a lot of people being like, oh, here's the goalie of the future. Who cares about Samsonov? Who cares about Matt Murray? Joe Wall's going to be the goalie of the future. Uh, let's see what he can do at the NHL level. I think he's played like, what, six or so games in the National Hockey League? Yeah. Let's give him a let's give him a chance, which he might get a chance this weekend if Murray's not ready to go. It's a back to back, I would assume he get one of these games. I think so. I, I I'm like ninety percent sure we're gonna see him in one of those games. Yeah, against Columbus, like it's the perfect opportunity to give him a game. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, all right, Dave. Before we go any further, before we continue with our cosign no signs. Why don't we hear from a word from uh, one of our other favorite show sponsors? Yes, and that is Athletic Greens. Uh, I take a scoop of AG1 every day in a glass of water just because I wanted to help optimize my health. I wanted to want a better gut health, more energy, want to optimize my immune system. I'm also someone that just doesn't like to have to remember to take this vitamin, that vitamin, oh, take this at this time, take this at that time, take this. It gets a little too confusing. That's why I really like Athletic Greens and what that, and the, just the ease of it because it's just one delicious scoop and I'm absorbing 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source, superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens, and it helps me start my day right. It's a special blend of greens that helps with many things, including gut health, nervous system, immune system, energy recovery focus, and aging uh, it's just something you know it's easy if you're in the, you know someone who's got a routine in the morning just take a scoop put it in your wire shake it up and you're good to go and the importance of taking multi multivitamins you know everyone kind of takes different kinds and it's important to choose one with high quality ingredients that your body will actually absorb ag1 is a small micro habit with big benefits it's one thing you can do every day to take care of yourself your subscription actually also comes with a year supply of vitamin D, which is so important to add in these winter months when we don't get as much sunlight. So Athletic Greens is also a climate neutral certified company in 2020. AG purchased carbon credits that support projects protecting old growth rainforest. For every purchase, they donate to organize uh, they donate to organizations helping get nutritious food to kids in need, including No Kid Hungry in the U.S. In 2020, AG1 donated 1.2 meals to kids in 2020. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop in a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. To make it easy, Athletic Green is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash NHL network. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash NHL network to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Welcome back into the Locked on Lease podcast. It's Mike DiStefano and Dave Morissuti. Uh, so Dave, I just sent you a video, uh, a tweet that I want you to pull up here. Um, as and We'll call this the, the final cosign, no sign, and then we'll get to... Uh, then we'll get to my my five most attractive trade assets. So our guy, you know, Nazem Kadri, got absolutely lit up tonight against the New York Rangers. Uh, Jacob Truba, just absolute train. Look at this hit. Oh, popped his helmet off. It popped. His helmet off, and I hate that these guys have to fight now after everything. Yeah, Dylan game. Dubé. I wouldn't ask Dylan Dubé to be the one to go and fight Jacob Chuba. Yeah, that also made no sense, uh, <laughs> for sure. This is but, the this is the staple Jacob Chuba hit. Well, Dave, cosign no sign. This hit is one hundred percent legal and fine. Oh, I don't even know where the contact. Let me, let me just look at it one more time. Shoulder. Oh. Through the chest. It's through the chest. What I don't like sometimes that guys do is they kind of, they don't leave their feet, but they rise up when they hit. Instead of just kind of going through the guy, sometimes they kind of raise up a little bit. But I still think it's a legal hit. It's just a really good hit. Uh, Truba always makes those hits, and a lot of people do not like it. 
I get it. Sometimes he, it's, you know, players are caught in a vulnerable position, but Kadri's got to be aware that it's open ice. Juba's coming at him like that. You just got to brace yourself for it. Yeah. When your head's down, I mean, and Truba's around you, that's not smart. Like you got to know where this guy is at all times. He's a throwback defenseman. He's, he's you know, almost like a modern day Scott Stevens, the way he throws his weight around out there. It's he's honestly probably has a hit go viral like every month now, I would say of some kind. And typically they're very clean hits. Like, they're powerful and, and and maybe sometimes do damage, unfortunately, but they're pretty clean in terms of where the contact is 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 made. It just happens to be a whole lot of force on them, and uh, that's that's kind of where people look at it and, and aren't big fans of uh, of the way that David Truba goes about his business. Um, Jacob Truba, not David Truba. Uh, all right, so. Well, let's do this uh, this power ranking because so we've been kind of teasing it for a couple days here. And, you know, the trade deadline's coming up in just a few weeks. And who knows, man, the way that Kyle Dubas has done business recently, he could move on from some of these pieces anytime now. Like, this is usually when Kyle Dubas makes a move. It's, he's usually pretty early on with his trades. Like, think back to the Muzzin one. Think back to, uh, you know, the, the, the move that he made for, for Gio or for um, – uh, Jack Campbell, uh, Ilya Labushkin last year. Like, he kind of makes some some deals. He's a wheel and deal type of guy. Let's get ahead of the market a little bit. So before this becomes uh, totally out of, date. <laughs> out of date, let's get to it. Um, so here's a power ranking for what I believe to be the five most attractive trade assets for Toronto. Do you want me to go one to five or five to one, Dave? Uh, go one to five. One they, to five. You right. already know what number one is. Yes, it's Matthew Nice. Matthew Nice is the number one trade asset that the Toronto Maple Leafs have. Their second round pick from a couple of years ago. Um, I think I saw today actually currently second in voting for the uh, the Hobie Baker. So um, there's still a little bit to go in the season. He could make his way up to first and win that award, which would be fantastic. Uh, but you know, he's a guy who's got. I think I saw. I was looking today. Thirty points through twenty. 20- game 17 goals um which is already two more than he had a season ago and there's still i think like five or six games to go in the regular season and then he's got playoffs as well and hopefully uh you know a, a final four or a frozen four is what he's hoping for this season after getting there last year so he's hoping to do that before going pro and coming to toronto but that would be the number one trade asset that toronto has is it's it's matthew nice and there's been a lot of conversations about whether or not He's an untouchable player when it comes to uh, to to the deadline and and the Maple Leafs approach to it. I mean, where do you lie here when it comes to Matthew Nyes? Are you willing to move on from him if if you can get the right piece to that you think will be helpful this season? Like, what's your what's your thought process when it comes to Matthew Nyes and his availability? Yeah, like this, whoever if whatever's on the table that involves Matthew Nyes. Better be like no doubt. It's not only going to help the Leafs this season, but next season, and maybe even the season after that, depending on the asset, right? I mean, you, you just you know that, yeah. Obviously, Matthew and I is still a wild card in a lot of ways because you just don't know what he's going to do at the NHL level. But you know, you also want to set a bit of a precedent here that you're not just going to throw away a, a top prospect on something that's only going to make you marginally better. So, like, an Ivan Barbashev would be a ludicrous. Yeah, I wouldn't do it. For Ivan In my opinion, it wouldn't, like, that wouldn't, I wouldn't do it for that. What about O'Reilly? Ryan O'Reilly? Yeah. No. Because I don't even think Ryan O'Reilly is a top rental forward at the deadline. Who do you, who do you, well, okay, Timo Meyer, is he involved in a Timo Meyer? It has to be right. Yeah, I would say is that so. The only is that the only player that you think you I like, have to like, 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 Travis connect me. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And to me, that's like it's a clear. You're getting a clear cut top six guy, not someone that's like maybe middle six. Like Timo Meyer is obviously a top six. Connect yeah. me, you get a little more cost assurance for the next few seasons. So that's where I would do it. I I just. I just want to do it on a guy that maybe will be a good fit in the middle six or top six. 
Like, I got to know for sure you're getting a clear cut upgrade up front. Chikrin? Or back end. Chikrin? Well, I was going to bring up his name earlier because we saw those weird rumors going about because he took the coyotes out of his bio and followed a bunch of leaves. Like, I'm not, I had somebody call me, be like, so what do you think about that? I'm like, I think he's definitely not coming to the Leafs right now because that means diddly squat to me. Yeah, uh, that was, uh, I don't even know what that w- website is. I don't want to give it any pub. I'm not giving like, any, no, I'm not going to do it. Was the, that ever the clickbaitiest title I've ever seen in my life? Yeah, we're not even going to say it. No. Don't even go and look at it, people. You're just feeding the beast. Yeah. I'll, what I will say about Jacob Chicken, because it got into the Discord. Then they the guys were talking about it. And I'm like, you know what? If you're going to want to go far in the Stanley Cup playoffs, do the Leafs have that Jacob Chikrin type impact on the blue line guy that can, in a playoff series, make that kind of step up their game and bring those game-changing plays? It's supposed to be Morgan Rowley, but he hasn't done it yet. Yeah, he doesn't play a rugged enough game to do that. So I, I've talked myself into thinking, you know what? Jacob Chicken would be a really nice addition to that blue line. And it would probably have Matthew Nice would probably have to be included in that. Yeah, I think they hang up the phone if if Nice isn't included. Yeah. And plus, it's, it's nice plus plus. Yeah. I yeah. Oh, I would I would assume so. Yeah. I wouldn't mind, you know, like they've got a couple of pieces that I think would be good. Like Bugstad would be a decent like depth addition as a fourth line center, maybe. I've liked that I've heard that name and like as a depth option. Yeah, but loss and Kraus though, like that's a lot of money. Like that guy's making how much did he make? Like four and a half million or something. Yeah, Yeah. oh I can't I did not realize that. Yeah, I don't think you could bring both of those guys in. Um, but you know, I think if you could bring in almost like how last year they brought in Giordano and Blackwell. Well, you yeah. bring in Chikrin and Nick Bukestad, right? Something like that, potentially. Kill two birds with one stone. Anyways, so Matthew Nyes is the number one most attractive trade asset for Toronto. And if you do want to get yourself a Meyer, a Chikrin, a Konechny even, um, it, it's going to cost Matthew Nyes. But it's a, it's a it's got to be a player, to your point, I'm with you, someone who's going to be a bona fide top six or top four defenseman. Uh, top six four, top four defensemen with term. Probably the only way that you move on from Matthew Nice. Number two option, most attractive trade asset I believe the Toronto Maple Leafs have. And this one is maybe one that might raise your eyebrow a bit, but I think it's Rasmus Sandin. I think Rasmus no, I, Sandin. Go ahead. No, I think it's totally, totally right. I think he he's a he's a player that the Leafs will wouldn't mind throwing out there if it means they're getting you know a pretty like you you solve your a surplus that you have on your back end to to kind of help a deficit maybe you have elsewhere in the lineup. Yeah, so I think that they could look to trade Sandine for like a top six piece and, and also maybe like a depth player as well. Um, like if we want to go the Barbashev route, if you go like Barbashev and Nico Mikola potentially, like maybe you get something else there, but like, that's what I mean. Like a two kill two birds with one stone. Maybe you, you throw Rasmus Sandin in this deal for, for a Chikrin or, or a Gavrikov. Maybe they would want, uh, you know, Sandin for a Gavrikov instead of getting, you know, another pick or prospect in, instead. So, uh, he would be somebody who I think would be high on, on a lot of lists because he's had a really good year. Like, you look at the numbers analytically, he's been terrific. Um, you know, he's been in somewhat sheltered pairings, I would say. And I know of late here in Toronto, we've kind of looked at him and said, eh, playoffs may be iffy just because it seems like he gets pushed around a little bit when they're playing more playoff type um, teams. Mm-hmm. opponents but maybe there's some other teams out there that have those bigger dudes that could just use a little bit more skill on the back end right and they could use a rasmus sandine on the third pair because they have the hulksters in their in their top four so potentially there could be a match uh, a match made in heaven somewhere and i think he would be an attractive piece um for for toronto because he's turned out to be you know a, a bona fide nhler um 
Third on my list is the least first round pick. And you could probably flip flop Sandine in the first round pick. I, I just think that the pick's going to be so late in, in the first round. I think that you probably would prefer to have the surefire guy in Sandine who is locked up this year and next year at a very reasonable $1.4 million cap hit. So the first round pick would be kind of that third option that you could use to try and go out and get yourself a, a player. I'm, I'm not sure if Toronto is interested in moving out first round picks, uh, at what extent they're willing to do it, how good the player has to be, how impactful they feel like it would have to be. But if you do look at the past, there have been examples of, of teams overpaying their first, you know, giving their first round pick and which seems like an overpayment. But it's turned out to be really impactful. Like I'm, I'm thinking back to Tampa Bay when they won their championships. They gave up a first round pick for Blake Coleman. They gave up a first round pick for Barkley Goudreau. And what it did was it kind of rounded out their team and they ended up winning two championships because of it. Now, I'm not saying that they're one piece away or anything like that. The Maple Leafs are, but I, I'm just saying maybe they give up a first round pick for a player that seems to be like a little bit of an overpayment. Like some are saying, oh, don't give up a first round pick for Gabrikov. His numbers aren't great. He's playing on a terrible team. Don't give up a first round pick for this player, that player. Well, if it's the right player and it gives the Maple Leafs a better chance in the playoffs, I think it's worth doing. Even if it is a slight overpayment, I think it will be worth doing. You want to bring up Lawson Kraus? I give up a first round pick for Lawson Kraus. So I think he would be the right type of player. Um, that you could kind of slot in there as a top six forward or middle six forward at, at the very least, that brings that different element. Um, and I still think it would be considered attractive to uh, rebuilding teams, but maybe not as attractive as Matthew Nyes or Rasmus Sandin. Uh, the fourth player on my asset list for Toronto would be Fraser Minton, who was the guy they took in the second round last year, the first player they took in the 2022 NHL entry draft is having a heck of a season in the WHL. Like this guy's scoring goals left, right, and center. And I think he's probably upped his value at this point from where he was at the start of the year. Um, certainly at, at the draft, I think if you were to redo it, he probably would be a, a, a late first round pick. So I think Fraser Minton, a guy who projects to be like a, a third line center in the National Hockey League, probably would be um, you know, a player that a lot of teams would covet as as like a B plus level prospect to go out and get, you know, a, a a decent middle six forward probably would be that that type of guy. Like maybe you would give up a Fraser Minton for an Ivan Barbashev type of deal, right? Like you don't quite want to give up a first or Sandine or Nyes, but maybe you do give up a Fraser Minton to make a deal like that. So that's uh, that's one player that uh, that I thought about. Maybe even. You know, I've, I've heard on the back end, Jake McCabe is a name that's been brought up a few times. He could be someone that, you know, Fraser Minton could be uh, could be a guy who goes the other way. Uh, and the fifth one in my power rankings, so we've got Nyes, Sandine, a first-round pick, Fraser Minton. And the fifth one I have would be Topi Niemela, uh, the right shot defenseman uh, in Finland. And I think actually he's coming back over to North America when his Finnish season ends, the, the Liga season. I believe he's coming to place in the, uh, in the in the AHL, so he's going to start his North American career rather shortly. Um, but he's somebody who I think, not that he's gone down in terms of a prospect, but I think that uh, he had a really big jump last year and the year prior. Hmm. And this year maybe he stagnated a little bit. His points his, in production has gone down a little. Um, so I think Topi Nimala, not to say that he's losing lust as a prospect, but Maybe he's not once the the top level rated prospect that he was. Maybe I, I would probably put him in a, a B prospect category here. So that would be my my top five: Matthew Nyes, Rasmus Sandin, a first round pick, Fraser Minton, and Topi Niemela. I would imagine if the Maple Leafs make a, a sizable deal or two, uh, there's a good chance that uh, one or multiple uh, of these assets, players, and picks will be dealt at the deadline. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. The Leafs don't – some say, oh, the X team and Y team have really good assets to trade the deadline. It's like, well, yeah, because they haven't really been in a position where they had to make big deals and give up big pieces. The Leafs haven't really – like, if you think about the last few years, really they've traded their first-round pick. Sean Dersey was someone that they they traded. They, ha they haven't traded many of their top prospects because most of them are on the team. Right. Yeah. 
you think about it, like there haven't been and they, well, last. I mean, yeah, literally all of their first round. So they've hit on all of their first round picks. Yeah. At the very least, they've hit on their first rounders, right? Like Nylander, Marner, Matthews, Sandy, Sandy Lily, Lily Green. Green. I think that's it. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. And then they've had a, a bunch of second round picks since then, right? So they've hit on a lot of those draft picks uh, in the first round. So, you know, guys like Fraser Minton, Topi Nimala, Matthew Nyes, luckily have been second round draft picks, third round draft picks that, you know, they've, they've kind of hit on and they've become valuable assets that they can use now, uh, you know, when, when it comes to the trade deadline to help their main club. Mm-hmm. And that to me is the point, like people become way too attached to, to prospects. Like at the end of the day, if you can make your main club better and give them an opportunity to, to win and go on a long run. I mean, I, I, I think people become too attached. Like you should be willing to move on from some of these players. Like to say that Matthew Nyes is untouchable is kind of silly to say that. Oh, I wouldn't trade Fraser Minton for, uh, for, uh, you know, an unrestricted free agent. That's not a bona fide top six guy. Like people expect Fraser Minton to get you like Patrick Kane or something like that's just not gonna, it's not realistic. You know what I mean? Um, so I, 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 I'm not as attached, I guess, to picks and prospects as, as some people are perhaps. And, and I would expect for the Maple Leafs in what is a very important season for them, both this year and next to, uh, to move some of these assets to, to bring in pieces that will help them this year and next. Yeah, I mean, your prospects are only as good as are valuable to you if they're contributing in some way to your organization. And in some cases, we've seen the Leafs make a bunch of, you know, like they will trade back, grab a bunch of picks, draft guys that many think will actually end up doing something for the team, and then not really much. You talk about how many players outside of the – first round that haven't really done much release well those are some of the guys that people didn't want to trade i'm like you might have been better off just trading it and cutting not cutting your losses but getting something before you mean uh, uh, totally gone jeremy brocco he yep brocco uh korshkov yeah another one that comes to mind I'm trying to think of like other ones that have kind of flamed out like um well there's been a lot of them like at the end of the day there's there there's been a lot of them and and enough that I, I, yeah enough that i would just say yeah don't be afraid if somebody wants one of your top prospects it just means like, they're valuable who was it uh who's the defensive prospect that there was like some hype for because he was killing it with the with the marlies for a hot minute there was it andrew nielsen yeah, it was always Nielsen Brocco in a second for whatever deal was for whatever top player. But yeah. it's like that's that's not like they, people overvalue the prospects. Always two guys, two guys that have amounted to nothing at the NHL level, and then I don't even know what that second round pick ended up being or what uh, it was. It was a trade for like three years in a row. So who, there's like three yeah. different years you could have picked for for a second rounder if you really wanted to. Um, yeah, we'll see though. We'll see what Kyle Dubas does. Less than a month of the NHL trade deadline. I expect him to be active. Um, I expect him to make at least one sizable move to improve the the main roster. And it's gonna come at the expense of uh of of one, if not you know, a couple of these um players or assets, you know. So we'll see what uh what Doobie ends up doing. All right. That'll do it for us here today on the podcast, Dave. I'd like to thank you all for listening and supporting the show. You can subscribe to the Locked On These Podcast on all podcasts and platforms, also on YouTube, uh, and receive daily Leafs content. We do new stuff every weekday, Monday to Friday. Um, follow myself on Twitter at Mickey underscore Canuck. Follow Dave at D underscore Morissuti. Follow the show as well at Locked On Leafs. All right, we'll be back with another episode for you guys tomorrow. Uh, But until then, keep it locked right here on Locked On Leafs.